Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I'm here to watch something terrible with all of you. Um, a uh, a video from a uh, from a philosophy channel that I'm vaguely familiar with um, is uh, Wisecrack. Um, was uh, was sent to me in the Discord server recently, and uh, it it I've seen some of Wisecrack's videos before, and uh, I've never quite been a fan, uh, both uh, both professionally and personally. Uh, and yet this one um, really had me quite literally yelling at the screen, so I thought I would uh, I would share the experience with uh, with all of you. So um, we're going to go through this, uh, pick it apart, talk about it a little bit uh, as we go through. Um, so this is a Widescrack's video, A Philosopher Reacts to God's Not Dead 2, uh, titled, actually that's not the title, that's, that's the thumbnail. Uh, the, the title is God's Not Dead 2, What is Faith Anyway? And he doesn't seem to know what faith is. From what I've seen, so we'll get to that when we get to that. Um, so I, I suppose this is a philosopher reacts to a philosopher reacts to God's not dead. Two um, just layers upon layers of cringe, for which I sincerely apologize in advance. But let's uh, let's have a look at this and let's see how this goes, and we'll we'll talk our way through this and and we'll see where he goes wrong because uh, I've uh, like I said from from what I've seen of Wisecrack's channel. Um, he is a trained philosopher. He knows his, he knows some of his stuff. It's just that, like any uh, trained academic philosopher, uh, he has an incredibly uh, specialized, narrow field of expertise. And from what I can tell, that narrow field of expertise is early modern, or sorry, late, probably more like late modern philosophy, something in the realm of, um, I don't know, early uh, early nineteenth through early to mid twentieth century um, European thought, broadly speaking. Um, the, at least from what I've seen of his, um, because outside of that, he seems to lose the plot quite terribly, uh, in a lot of cases. And so in this, this video is absolutely no exception. So we're, we're going to have a look at this, um, keeping in mind that my expertise is just as narrow, <laughs> um, but, uh, but rather different. So I, I, my, my expertise being, uh, being primarily scholasticism and, uh, philosophy of religion, very relevant to this video, of course, uh, as well as metaphysics. Uh, meta ethics, things like that. So, uh, without much further delay, let's uh, let's get into this, and uh, and we'll see what he has to we'll see what he has to say, and then we'll see what we have to say about what he has to say. Oh yeah. This video is sponsored by Shaker and Spoon. What's up, guys? Michael here with a special holiday treat. Today, I'm going to dive back into the MCU of religious film franchises, God's Not Dead. In the second installment, we see my childhood crush, Clarissa, who explained it all, playing a teacher who gets persecuted by the state for briefly quoting the Bible in an AP history class. Like the first film, God's Not Dead 2 sets out to objectively prove the existence of an all-knowing divine entity. It's like Thanos, but more into plagues than snaps. Okay, uh, a lot going on already. <clears throat> uh, I, I'd make myself bigger, but um, let's keep the, uh, the 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 imagery up here from some from a much better piece of media. Uh, so first of all, uh, as I understand it, this is a decent enough plot synopsis uh, of both the first and the second films. Um, I have not seen the second film. Um, I maybe I maybe should, <laughs> uh, if only for uh, if, only, if only for laughing at more than laughing with. Um, I have seen the first one, I think, a long time ago, um, and it was, uh, it, it, it earns the reputation that it has, which is not very good. Mm. Um, it is very, it is very, um, it's very evangelical cheerleading type of, uh, it's a very evangelical cheerleading type of movie. And, uh, and of course that's, that's, that's all well and good and that's fine. And it does actually employ some, some decent apologetic arguments throughout however the framing of it the nerd framing of of uh, as i understand it all of these films is uh, is very contrived and it's very very manichaean almost um the 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 very good the very very good christian college student in the first one or in this case public school teacher christian ish i don't even know if she's quite christian here i'm not sure uh, but the public school teacher or whatever the hero is absolutely perfectly heroic and of course the dastardly atheistic villains are are basically snidely whiplash um trying to tie people to railroad tracks at every possible opportunity and that is i think a little bit tiresome in terms of plot structures but who ever said that uh, that uh, religious message movies had to be any good i mean they should be but they certainly aren't 
at least in most cases. Um, anyway, <clears throat> uh, I like I said, so I have not actually seen this film. I am I'm reacting purely to what he is saying about it here. So I'm not going to be judging the film on its merits because, I, from my understanding, it doesn't have a whole lot of them. Um, I'm more looking at wise, looking at uh, what Wisecrack has to say about the film. Uh, and, well, he just said quite the thing here, um, that, uh, in, in, in explaining that we that the film is the whole purpose of the films, trying to, trying to objectively demonstrate the existence of God, um, in using imagery from the Prince of Egypt, he also is, uh, is analogizing to Thanos, but plagues rather than snaps, which is, uh, okay, so there's a lot of issues with this. Um, now I've, I have, ha I have videos on the MCU, uh, here and there. I'll put links to those in the description if you're interested in my input on those topics in particular. But in this case, uh, Thanos is, is incredibly, incredibly far, uh, from, uh, from God, qua that than which no greater can be conceived. Uh, let me go back and see exactly what he said here. Hold on. And right about there, there. Let me see exactly how he described this. Hold on. Entity. It's like Thanos, but more into plagues than snaps. Okay, divine entity, more into plagues than snaps. Um, I, if you recall, there was a uh, there was a very controversial statement uh, from Pope Francis, uh, not too terribly long ago. Actually, at this point, I suppose it must have been, it may have been nearly a decade ago. Um. Where he uh where he said that God is not a divine being. Um, the Italian, or I think it was the Italian being Demiurgos. Um, so Demiurge, God is not a divine entity, uh, like he's describing here. God is uh, is not a being, as Thomas Aquinas would say. Um, this could not be more different than it, God being, of course, the, the fundamental grounding of being itself. Um, Thanos, of course, is a particular entity, a particular being, with uh, with a significant amount of power, once he has you know the infinity gauntlet and the gems and yada 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 all of that, uh, but is very 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 far from anything like omnipotent. Uh, omnipotence is uh, is a is a a quality which can, in principle, only map onto God being the creator of reality. Even if we take Thanos at his word that he'd be capable of wiping out the universe to atoms and reconstructing it from the ground up. Uh, with he talks about an endgame, which he talks about in the comics as well. That's straight from the Infinity Saga. Um, that is, even even that is a far cry from the power of God, which is not to reorganize existing matter. That would be a demiurge uh, or a divine being in that sense. Uh, rather, the power of God is that as the power to create ex nihilo, to create from nothing at all, and not only to create, but to sustain in being. So the, the, the divine act of creation is the act of creation of all things across all times simultaneously through one divine act. Um, and then reality, reality which we experience is, is that creation itself. It is, it is uh, the, the working out of that act of creation. Uh, and so again, uh, he's already here, I would say, technically speaking, poisoning the well. Um, by assuming that what we're talking about here is a god, like small, lowercase g, a divine being, a powerful entity, rather than, uh, rather than, to use Anselm's formulation again, that than which no greater can be conceived. And again, I think that this is, um, I assume it's just for comedy, and I, I, I should assume that he knows better, um, but we'll see. I, uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it is, though, I think very, very important to make this distinction here, that what we're talking about here is God, um, the God of monotheism, that that which no greater can be conceived, uh, not just a particular but powerful uh, entity with, with you know a, a creature with super uh, with superpowers. Anyway, let's proceed and see where he goes from here. More into plagues than snaps. Uh, But does it raise any valid theological or philosophical points, or does it exist solely to make my childhood Sunday school classes look super woke by comparison? Well, let's find out. Okay. Um, it does here and there, uh, and he's going to dismiss them quite heavily. Um, the first one actually did. Uh, uh, from from what I recall, and like I said, it's been a while, and it wasn't it was not a particularly memorable experience. But 
the sort of debate that is the culmination of the first film uh, is actually a decently well put together philosophical ser uh, series of philosophical and apologetic arguments at a very basic level, of course, but but it is actually decently well put together, even from a philosophical standpoint. Um, and so that is actually something to, to take away from it. Um, this one, I get the impression from this, maybe a little bit less so. Uh, but again, these these sorts of things are are intended to be no, one or both of two things. One evangelical cheerleading, like I was talking about earlier. This is a feel good movie for uh, for evangelical Christians, people who people who want to uh, want to see. Uh, Christianity prevail in the face of uh, in the face of secular difficulty. Okay, and I, I mean again, I can't really object to that. I'm, I like feel good movies, just like the next uh, the next well adjusted person. These just aren't really my uh, my cup of tea or uh, cup of coffee in tonight's case. Um, but uh, the other thing that they do is they present they present a sort of very basic archetypal. Um, structure of how and why Christianity is defensible in uh, in and among the secular world. And I think that that is, uh, that is a good trend that we have been seeing, uh, because I think we have been certainly seeing a trend towards, towards Christians taking their faith seriously and uh, being ready to give an argument for the faith within, etc., that sort of thing. Uh, and so I think that, that God's Not Dead, this, this whole series, while well, they themselves are probably based on the first one, based on what, what like clips and such I've seen of the other ones, they're themselves not great examples, uh, at least not particularly sophisticated examples of, uh, of Christian apologetics. I think that they fit well into, uh, I'm put this, into a positive cultural development within Christian culture of being willing to defend the faith and being ready to defend the faith and wanting to. I think that's a, I think that at least is a good development. Uh, he's going to disagree with me, but of course he is. Anyway, that's cute. Uh, he's going to try and disagree with me from a Christian standpoint, but we'll have to get there when we get there. Find out in our first ever Philosopher Reacts to a sequel, God's Not Dead 2. And spoilers ahead for a movie that dares to ask, what if white Southern evangelical Christians are actually the most oppressed group in America? But before we get into it, I want to tell you about this video. Okay. Um, forgive me, I am going to skip the sponsor segment. Um, he's going to talk more about the whole, like, evangelical persecution thing um and i think he's overly dismissive of it and uh again i'll talk about that uh because there's a uh there's there is something to there's something to be said about the about christian persecution but there's also something to be said about the christian persecution complex so when, when we get to that point which is i don't know about like i don't know uh Jeez, I don't know. Forget where he put it. It's in here somewhere. But when we get to that point, uh, we'll, we'll we'll have to see and uh, see because he we'll see what points he has against this, and and but we'll also see what points the movie is making and see if they're making it making them well. All right, let's keep going. Show okay. Let's start in Sabrina's classroom where she's teaching about Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. And so peaceful nonviolence comes first in India under Gandhi, and then later here in the United States under Dr. King and others as a means of achieving civil rights. But what makes nonviolence so radical? is its unwavering commitment to a nonviolent approach, not just initially, but in the face of escalating persecution by the opposing force. I didn't... Hold on, hold on. I didn't think this through. This is the placement of my face. Um, but I'm gonna keep it, because I, if I do this, we're making eye contact. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'll, 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 I'll let him talk. Is its unwavering commitment to a nonviolent approach, not just initially, but in the face of escalating persecution by the opposing force. Okay, so Clarissa is doing a decent job of explaining it all for the most part. Um, it's a bit weird to imply that Gandhi invented peaceful nonviolence. After all, this perspective has its religious origins in Jainism, Hinduism, and Buddhism, which way predate him. But hey, she's an overworked and underpaid public school teacher, so who are we to judge? It's also worth noting that for King, nonviolence wasn't just an ethical stance, but a type of political strategy. Now, he Okay, hold on a second. So before we get, okay, I'm gonna back up a second, because when he's talking about the, the origins of, uh, of nonviolence, um, that is an oversimplification of matters. He is oversimplifying matters. He's trying to complicate things further, but he's over, he's instead steering the other direction, oversimplifying. Um, he's pointing to Jainism and Buddhism as the origin of nonviolence, and I think that I mean, fair. Um, 
I think that that's probably chronologically correct, at least. Maybe not Jainism, but Buddhism, I think, uh, would probably be chronologically the, the origin point of uh, religious nonviolence. Um, but I think he's, he's, he's dramatically missing the point here that, that we're not talking about nonviolence per se. We're talking about nonviolent uh, peaceful resistance. Uh, and he is talking about what he's going to go on to talk about, which is, uh, which is the political application of nonviolence. And that was missing from Buddhism. Buddhism, Buddhists, uh, the, the, the Buddhists he's talking about, so going, going all the way back to the origin points of Buddhism, um, did not hold to <clears throat> uh, nonviolence for political ends. They held to nonviolence for, for, for strictly uh, metaphysical and theological reasons, for ethical reasons, broadly speaking. Um, and so uh, we, we ought not to say that, that, that nonviolence is being treated as a means, right? For, for, the, for Buddhism, uh, nonviolence is an end in itself. It is, uh, it is wrong intrinsically and always to commit violence against another being. Um, another being is, I'm sorry, another being is a bit of a stretch there, but do, do you get what I'm saying? What a Westerner would say, another being. Mm. Anyway. And so nonviolence as a method, as a means... Uh, doesn't doesn't really come up until uh, doesn't really come up in in Eastern in Eastern thought that I'm aware of, um, but it does come up in a lot of Western thought, uh, and and I'll talk about that a little bit when he talks about uh, Martin Luther King's um, political nonviolence. Uh, the point is though that that he's being overly he's being overly broad about the origins of nonviolence when it was very clear that Melissa Joan Hart's character, the, the teacher, was talking about the origin point of uh, political nonviolence, of nonviolent peaceful resistance, of civil disobedience, of, of um, well, I mean, of the Christian notion of turning the other cheek, if you will, for example, of uh, not resisting evil when the evil is done to you as a way of exposing the evil being done. That is a specific thing that, that as far as I know, and I could be, I Technically, I suppose I could be mistaken about this. As far as I know, that does not find its origin point in Buddhism. I don't think. But he is going to talk more about Martin Luther, Martin Luther King specifically, and that we'll let him talk about that before I dive into this in any more detail, this political aspect of nonviolence. So let's keep going. Predate him. But hey, she's an overworked and underpaid public school teacher, so who are we to judge? It's also worth noting that for King, nonviolence wasn't just an ethical stance, but a type of political strategy. Now, he believed that nonviolent protests for civil rights would ultimately be more effective than violence in arousing solidarity. When asked about civil rights protests in the South, King said the movement was ideally arousing the dozing conscience of the white community and hoping to ultimately achieve the beloved community and the type of brotherhood that is necessary for us to survive in a meaningful manner. But things are about to get a little, uh, tense in the classroom. Okay, hold on. Before he continues the, with the tense in the classroom, that is, I think, absolutely correct. Um, that is um, that is a strategy that became very, very common in the middle of the 20th century with Gandhi and Martin Luther King, and that's why the teacher here is connecting the two of them, because these two were major figures in political nonviolence at the time. Um, now, we can also point, though, we can point further back than this, obviously. Um, I, as I already mentioned, turning the other cheek, this is already a Christian principle. This is a Christian political principle that goes all the way back to Christ. This goes back to, to Jesus talking about, um, uh, you know, um, when someone takes, uh, takes your uh, coat, give him your tunic as well. That sort of thing. When someone asks you to carry something for a mile, go, does it go five? Is it five? Someone's going to, someone's going to correct me on this in the comments. And, uh, and this is a means of, of uh, exposing the wrongdoing of the oppressor, of the, of the tyrant, of, of the wrongdoer. And by exposing the wrongdoing, you expose it not only to themselves, uh, but to the people around you and to ultimately God. <clears throat> if you, if, if, in other words, if somebody is willing to do something wrong to you, um, if somebody is willing to strike your cheek, turn the other cheek so that they are, so that you are, um, Sort of, com I guess you would say, compelling them to do something worse still to strike your other cheek, um, as would be socially inappropriate, would be a true offense rather than simply a uh, simply a minor slight. So basically, it is a form of <clears throat> form of escalation, but all of the escalations on the part of the aggressor rather than any escalation on the part of the aggressed upon. Uh, and again, it is it is a way of of exposing the uh, exposing the wrongdoings of uh, in this case political tyrants and political um, authoritarians 
Uh, now, this goes back further than Christ as well. Um, you can you can look to uh, my favorite example of this is Socrates. Uh, I've explained uh, the the Socrates use of this uh, of this methodology in in another video where I discuss uh, Plato's Apology, which is the account of Socrates' trial and execution, well, trial leading up to his execution. Um, but I think that this is uh, it, it's worth slightly recapping here because uh, what Socrates ultimately does is he's given every opportunity to to fight against legally speaking fight against uh, the charges put against him. He's given every opportunity. Um, to argue against it, he's given every opportunity to to basically uh, cease what he's been doing, recant, and apologize in the modern sense of apologize. And then he's also given every opportunity to to flee, to flee into exile, uh, and flee Athens and save his life. And he takes none of those opportunities, and instead he basically just makes Athens kill him. And by making Athens kill him, uh, Plato predicted correctly, I might add. That uh, that Athens would be forever known as the the city that killed Socrates, and so that the 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 corruption of the political system is put uh, is put in stark contrast to uh, to the wisdom and innocence of Socrates um, by by basically forcing them to put him to death at like eighty something by the way, which is already like he's already past life expectancy at this point. It's not like they're killing an old man. For being annoying and for disrupting the political the the, the political stability of of Athens, and so again, uh, if you want more on this and more more of what I have to say on the topic, uh, first of all, read read Plato's Apology with this in mind. Brilliant, brilliant piece of uh, of uh, subversive political commentary. But then also, uh, you'll find my uh, my my lecture on this uh, in the description. Uh, but again, you 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 find this method of nonviolence, I think, more strongly. In the West, primarily because of the West, uh, Western, uh, traditional Western philosophy's emphasis on the individual rather than on the, rather than on the collective, and this is an individualistic kind of uh, kind of procedure. All right. Uh, so let's see what happens next, and see what he has to object about. Isn't that sort of like what Jesus meant when he said that we should love our enemies? Oh, well, yeah. oh she's gonna, you're gonna get her in so much trouble, kid. Why did you ask that? Yes, you have heard it said: love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you will be children of your Father in heaven. Dr. King confirmed the link, describing his inspiration Look at this kid on cell phone. saying Christ furnished the spirit and motivation, while Gandhi furnished the method. Except Okay, <clears throat> he has a really, really bad habit of talking over the thing he's commenting on. In this video, it's not that bad, but some of the other ones I've seen, he basically just makes what he's commenting on inaudible be by stopping, by, by not, by, sorry, by not stopping like I have done, but instead of just yammering over it, uh, in some cases, like like he'll say a full paragraph while we're supposed to be listening to something that he's trying to comment on. It's a problem. It's a stylistic problem, but it's a problem, and it's something that I want to really. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to do the proper polite thing, and I'm going to scoot us back a few seconds. Now let's proceed. Look at this kid snitching on his cell phone. Saying Christ furnished the snitching. spirit motivation. While Gandhi furnished the method. Except that that didn't work. Jesus got himself killed and everybody knows that. <laughs> well, so did Dr. King. Okay, um, now this. So did Socrates. That was the whole point. Okay, so it's, um, if we look at this from a Christian perspective, this is the Christus Victor model. This is the model of Christ victorious over death. Uh, Christ allows himself to be killed as an innocent, uh, as an innocent sacrifice. Um, and so exposes the, uh, exposes the injustice of it was the injustice of us, human beings, human society. Uh, but then also, um, by death, basically expending its, expending its power, expending itself upon him, that is how he draws it in to be able to defeat it. And that's exactly the same thing we see with nonviolent resistance in general. Socrates did the same thing. He drew out the power of, of, uh, of the Athenian assembly to execute him. We see with uh, with Gandhi and Martin Luther King, they drew out the oppressive authority and the oppressive power of the the British and American empires, respectively, um, to the point where they overextended themselves. Not just overextended themselves from a sort of strategic standpoint, uh, but overextended themselves morally, ethically, to the point where everyone was capable of seeing uh, the oppression that they were putting forward and and suddenly became opposed to it because they saw uh, the true nature of uh, the true nature of the beast. Uh, and so again, it's, it's it's exactly the same strategy uh, that the, and she's she's so right to point that out. That was a 
spectacular little comeback. That well, didn't they kill Jesus? Well, yeah, they killed the king too. Yeah, they killed Socrates too. Yeah, they. That's the whole point. This is a hell of a gambit. You're gonna die. You're gonna win. Let's see what. Let's see his uh, his response to all this. Jesus got himself killed, and everybody knows that. <laughs> well, so did Dr. King. Okay. Um. Now this, believe it or not, is where pops off. Now, the notion of Jesus being entirely nonviolent uh, is debatable. After all, he does at one point say he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Division between people. Um, didn't bring, didn't, uh, yeah, like, read the next, the, the next bit of context here. I'll scoot myself down. Ooh, okay. So, here. Um, For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. The sword here is not talking about violent confrontation or violent conflict. The sword here is talking about the split of people into uh, into uh, Christians and uh, and non Christians, but saved and the damned, the sheep and the goats, the, the wheat and the chaff, etc. Again, all of this is in that particular context. He's not talking about I did not come to bring peace, but a sword does not mean that. He's not referring to the Book of Revelation uh, prophecies of, of the sword of the sword of truth spewing forth from Christ's mouth, which, again, is because he speaks the truth, because he is the truth, he is the way, truth, and the life, etc., etc., etc. It's very easy to take these sword lines out of context. Uh, now, I honestly expected him to talk about the uh, the turning over the tables of the money changers here. I expected him to talk about uh, imploring the disciples to sell their cloaks and buy swords. There are examples you can point to of Jesus not being strictly nonviolent, but on the whole, um, his mission as such, which was the defeat of death, which was overcoming death, which was, which was uh, the granting of eternal life, that was a nonviolent mission. And that is precisely what we're talking about here. Not sell your cloak and buy a sword, not turning over the tables of the money changers, not Dividing families, which is what this is referring to. Anyway, gross misinterpretation, but let's see. Let's see what else he's got. So our grown-up teenage witch might be missing some subtlety here. But what's most important is that MJ Hart quoted the Bible in a public school. Oh. And in this fever dream vision of America, that's apparently straight up criminal. She's quickly suspended for the It I mean, there are there are a lot of places where that's that's not allowed. Now, uh, it, well, it's not allowed on the part of teachers. Uh, there, it is true that students are basically given carte blanche to uh, to talk about religion, um, but the way that the way that she uh, put it forward here, um, you can interpret that if you're being uncharitable, and I mean, of course, of course, school boards and lawyers and you know secularist lawyers are going to be uncharitable, so there you go um you can interpret this as promotional and i think that uh, an organization somebody like maybe the aclu that sort of thing they would interpret this as promotional promoting christianity rather than just describing it um now in, a, in the historical context yeah you should be able to talk about this sort of thing but it's a public school and public schools are finicky about this sort of thing because they are on purpose more on this later and in this fever dream vision of America, that's apparently straight up criminal. She's quickly suspended for the offense, but refuses to apologize to the school board. Now she's about to go on trial, which is very realistic, so let's meet her courtroom adversary. The last thing we need. Love this guy, first of all. Spectacular actor. One of my favorites. Um, but, um, going on trial is, yeah, that, to be fair, that's, that's wildly unlikely. Um. If anything, it would go the suit would go the other way. It would be wrong. It would be her suing for wrongful termination. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll hand it to him. This is uh, this is not exactly uh, particularly uh, realistic when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the the circumstances of this trial. But whatever, I, I'll hand it to him. No, this this now that isn't to say this sort of thing could not go to court. Um, I could see a civil case being put forward, maybe. But it would be more like a civil case of the student versus the school board. The school board would have to be defending the actions of the, of the, of the teacher. Something like that. Um, which, firing the teacher would almost certainly get a case like that thrown out. Um, but then, uh, firing the teacher might, might 
bring a case for like viewpoint discrimination or something like that, but that turns the the, the persecution narrative on its head. So you can't really can't really do it that way. So it has to be a criminal trial, and they have to do it this way. So man, I'll hand it to them that this is a little bit contrived. Well, not a little. Bit. This is incredibly contrived. Apologize to the school board. Now she's about to go on trial, which is very realistic. So let's meet her courtroom adversary. The last thing we need is a bunch of religious fanatics protesting outside of our house. We'll work to keep it out of the media for now. But next year, when you're applying to all the colleges, you'll be able to tell the story of how Brooke was part of a landmark constitutional case concerning the separation of church and state. Okay, so this is a side note, but it's very funny that for the part of liberal lawyer, they cast an actor who once played the literal devil on a show called Reaper. I could be nice. Oh, he's a really good actor. And he's a really good, like, He's a really good creepy actor. He does a great job. Um, my favorite role of his roles, I guess my favorite roles of his role roles. He's in a few episodes. I forget which, but he uh, when he's in Psych, he's he does such a good job because that whole show is wildly over the top and a little bit weird. Um, and so he fits right into the cast. So you know, he plays a priest in that one. I don't know why you didn't, why they didn't for that. You know, it's weird that they take the actor who, who's Satan and something else. But he's also a priest and other things, so come on. Come on, guys. I don't know. Uh, there's not much to this critique of his, but again, it's it's a little bit bad faith. Anyway, moving on. Uh, to be a fly on that casting room wall. Also, just in case the filmmakers are, are watching, if you're casting a heretical and charming YouTube host for uh, God's Not Dead 5, Web of Sin, feel free to let me know in the comments. I'm very affordable. Okay, let's get back to Satan. We're going to prove once and for all that God is dead. Um, and now we're, we're really cooking. So just like in the first installment, we have a sinister dude whose life mission seems to be proving that God is dead. Now, from a like philosophical perspective, this is a pretty meaningless call to action. It would be one thing to try and argue that it's metaphysically improbable that an omnipotent creator exists. But it's another thing altogether to argue that God is dead. It okay, uh, before we get to Loch Ness Monster. Okay, so... He's going to try desperately to explain what Nietzsche meant by God's not dead or God is dead. Uh, and so therefore what this, what the, what the movies mean by the, by the opposite. Um, and I have some things to say about that, but first of all, uh, he, he points out that what, uh, hold on, let me replay this a little bit. Now, from a like philosophical perspective, this is a pretty meaningless call to action. It would be one thing to try and argue that it's metaphysically improbable that an omnipotent creator exists. Hey, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> metaphysically improbable. Okay, that's making a lot of assumptions. Uh, that is assuming that we are talking about inductive arguments here, which, to be fair, they are in the film, as far as I understand it. We're not talking about metaphysical deductions. Uh, but he is talking about metaphysics, right? So uh, as a philosopher, he should, he should realize that most of the best arguments for God's existence are deductive. And so to, to claim that God's existence is metaphysically improbable is entirely pointless. Uh, this is actually something I point out in uh, in my philosophy of religion course, as well as my my sort of series of videos on philosophy of religion, preamble of fide, um, the preambles of faith. And it's that um, that if you are relying on a deductive argument for God's existence, that is the ontological argument, or a, an ontological argument, or excuse me, one of the cosmological arguments, say Thomas Aquinas' cosmological argument, a contingency argument. Um, um, uh, even something like a transcendental argument or something like this, then it doesn't matter at all whether God's existence is metaphysically probable or not, because what a uh, what a deductive argument or a deductive demonstration does is it shows without any uh, possibility of error uh, or any possibility of uh, the alternative being the case that something is true. So if you can deductively prove something, which is, again, what all of these arguments are attempting to do, then probability arguments become entirely meaningless, which is why things like uh, things like appeals to, to scientific explanation, appeals to, uh, to infinite universes, appeals to, uh, to appearance of design, or design, or, uh, or most of the design arguments, that sort of thing, or the counter arguments, uh, even appeals to uh, to the the sort of evidential problems of evil. At least most versions of evidential problems of evil do not matter ultimately uh, if you were discussing things uh, in terms of deductive arguments. Now, not every apologist is going to rely on deductive arguments for God's existence. I think that they should because I think that they are absolutely the strongest arguments, and they they rule out a lot of counter arguments immediately. Uh, but again, that's 
that is that is just me pointing out that that he is making a lot of assumptions here about the kinds of arguments uh, and the kinds of discussions that we're going to be having and that we're going to be employing when we're talking about theology and we're talking about God. Anyway, pet peeve of mine, and it's something that I needed to address because again, this is some this is this is important because it's the kind of discussion that we're having and it's the kind of questions and the kind of answers that we're providing uh, for the context here. So let's uh, let's keep going. He's going to talk about Nietzsche now. So, and I think, from my understanding, Nietzsche is uh, is closer to his area of ex academic expertise. So, I still think he gets some things wrong. But let's go. But it's another thing altogether to argue that God is dead. It's it's not like anyone would say the Loch Ness monster is dead. We just say it doesn't exist. But it's cool that a drunk Scotsman started a funny myth to mess with people years ago, and everyone just went with it. So, okay, that's really stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is really stupid. Everyone knows that Nietzsche did not mean that God used to be alive and is no longer alive. The movies, and everyone in the movies, know that no one intends that to mean that God used to be alive and is not anymore. When they're saying that God's not dead, they're not arguing against that point, because that point is really stupid. Just like he's saying that it is. Like, to say that... Okay, to say that the Loch Ness Monster is dead, to use his ridiculous example, if you were to say that, what you would be meaning is clearly not, I have found the corpse of the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> it would be more like saying that that the idea that there is a plesiosaur living in, in a lake in the highlands of Scotland is no longer tenable. It is not something that is even worth arguing about, because that's the context here, right? The context here within these films is that the, the bad guy atheists are, are saying the equivalent of God is dead. The question of God is so definitively settled that, that discussing it and arguing about it is pointless. It's a pointless endeavor. The topic is dead. And that God obviously does not exist. God isn't real. And so the counterpoint is God's not dead. He is surely alive. Is that how the song goes? I don't, I, I try not to remember. Um, right. It, it is, it is the, the counterpoint is to say that this, this question has not been settled and you're wrong. Right? God is alive referring to, you know, God being the author of life, uh, the Jesus rising from the dead. It's, it's a neat little play on words. It's basically just a, it's a joke. It's a reference to exactly the thing he's about to talk about with Frederick Nietzsche. But he's refusing to acknowledge that because he had to make a Loch Ness Monster joke, I guess. And it is getting in the way of his ability to explain things. He should be able to do this better. He should be able to do this better. I think. Maybe not. We philosophers are not actually good at comedy. I'm, I'm evidence of that. But come on. Try hard, man. Try harder. All right, let's keep going. So where does this death of God obsession come from? Probably Nietzsche. from a willful misreading of Nietzsche. Definitely. These folks assume that when Nietzsche said God is dead, he was being an angry atheist edgelord. Instead yes, uh, he was. Um, to a large extent, yeah. So uh, before, he could, before he goes on here, yes, uh, Nietzsche was an atheist. He did not think that God exists. He thought the, the, the very idea of God was an absurdity. And he thought that it was obviously false. He did hold that God does not exist, and he was angry. He was a very angry person. In fact, he was a literal madman who was institutionalized for a large portion of the end of his life. And he was edgy. Like, everything that he wrote was unbelievably edgy, even taken in its proper context. So yes, Nietzsche was an angry, edgy atheist. There's no denying that. Um, the point, though, is that what he said there implies that Nietzsche did not actually think that God doesn't exist. Let's listen to this again. I want to, I want to see exactly what he has to say here. The Loch Ness Monster is dead. We just say it doesn't exist, but it's cool that a drunk Scotsman started a funny myth to mess with people years ago and everyone just went with it. So, okay. So point of comparison, what Nietzsche should have said, apparently, was that God obviously doesn't exist. But it's neat that some drunken desert people came up with an idea and everybody decided to go along with it three thousand like three or four thousand years ago. Which is basically what Richard Dawkins says in and the New Atheists have said 10, 15 years ago, in so many words. It, desert religion, yada yada yada, that whole thing that you're all familiar with. So 
if we're taking him, if we're taking his arguments here seriously, then that is what Nietzsche should have said if he meant God doesn't exist, which he did. He did mean that God doesn't exist. There's more to what he said, and he's going to extrapolate on some of that. And to be fair, he does a decent job of extrapolating on at least some of it. Um, but it is important to note that Nietzsche was, in fact, an atheist. He did, in fact, think that God doesn't exist. And he did, in fact, think that the idea of God was not worth considering. And that is very important. And that's worth noting, worth keeping in mind as we go through the rest of his explanation. So let's keep going. So where does this death of God obsession come from? Probably from a willful misreading of Nietzsche. These folks yeah, assume that when Nietzsche said God is dead, he was being an angry atheist edgelord. Instead, as we've said numerous times on this channel, he was criticizing European culture and philosophy for its own intellectual hubris. And his critiques of Christianity were specifically about its tendency to make believers care more about heaven than earth. Honestly, this, this whole film franchise is, is doing Nietzsche kind of dirty. Um, but speaking of philosophy students who believe that religion should inspire- Hold on, hold on, hold on. That was it? I, I honestly thought there was more than this. Okay, so no, that is a terrible, it's an even worse misreading of Nietzsche. Um, no, he he did not think that. It's not that he thought that that religious philosophies were um, were emphasizing heaven rather than earth. It, it, it's rather that they were um, that they were reinforcements of a particular power structure rather than being objectively true about anything. He was he was actually a uh, very uh, very early. Uh, inspiration to the to the sort of post structuralist movement uh, seventy years later or so, uh, where where he points out again Nietzsche points out that that uh, that this, uh, this idea of uh, of Christianity and Christian morals and Christian ethics is is yes it's an emphasis on the afterlife but more importantly it is an emphasis on a particular set of moral uh, of moral beliefs a, a particular set of uh, a set of ethics an ethical outlook. Uh, that places the the en the emphasis and the end upon the other rather than upon uh, upon one's own benefit, and that it is uh, that it's ultimately ultimately self destructive. This idea of, this is his idea of slave morality uh, being uh, originating from from Christianity. Uh, his theological critiques are again that uh, that this is a uh, sort of uh, sort of to use a, the language of a contemporary Sigmund Freud, it's, it's a kind of psychological projection. The idea of, uh, he even writes about this idea of God is, is a stand-in for the father, which he had serious father issues. Frederick Nietzsche did. So to be fair, I don't want to overly psychologize him, but there may be a reason for him thinking this. Um, and so again, the point of God is dead, the, the point of that in the particular context of, I think it's, that's from Thus Spake Zarathustra, I think. Um, when the madman says God is dead, yes, and we have killed him, he is, he is, he is at the same time saying that this idea of God has run its course, and it is philosophically and even culturally untenable at this point in history, which turned out to be obviously mistaken, but every atheist thinks this. Um, especially every edgy atheist. But um, he, uh, he thought that the, the idea of God had run its course and it was no longer a sort of live option to use another contemporary of his, uh, William James uh, terminology. That it's not really something that, that uh, a person in the modern world can believe in because it is, there are no uh, coherent and cogent arguments for it. It, it. it can't sustain itself. And because of this, because we have, we have culturally, philosophically, etc., killed God, that this has particular consequences for uh, for our ethics moving forward, our ethical outlook, our ethical systems. It has certain uh, certain consequences for our social system, um, and that these consequences are not these are mixed. These are significantly mixed consequences because it means that we are we're moving forward forward in a good way towards uh, a clearer understanding of re of reality. But that that is going to be a very painful process for everybody, uh, even for those those sort of Ubermenschen who are capable of. Uh, taking control of this uh, of this kind of a situation and taking advantage of it even for them it's going to be very difficult and very painful and so Nietzsche's point here is by, by claiming by pointing out that god is dead is that that we're pointing to a particularly uh significant uh social change and a social hurdle uh that is that is before us because of the uh the consequences of our our philosophical musings are are, are coming to understand that god doesn't exist that's what he's talking about
excuse me, he is talking about the idea of God no longer being culturally and philosophically plausible or relevant. Keep that in mind. That's what he's talking about. Talking about the idea of God being dead, culturally dead, and that that is going to have particular uh, particular consequences for society moving forward, and that not all of those consequences are going to be good. Okay, that's what Nietzsche is talking about here. And I thought he was going to say it, because I, he said it before in other videos. I thought he was going to actually extrapolate on it. I think he doesn't, because it's going to undermine his later points. Because, my God, did this undermine his later points. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's see those later points, shall we? This, this whole film franchise is, is doing Nietzsche kind of dirty. Um, but speaking of philosophy students who believe that religion should inspire people to transform the material conditions of their world, let's get back to MLK. Miss Kinney, are you familiar with Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail? Yes, it's a seminal piece of civil rights history. In that letter, Dr. King makes numerous faith-based references, does he not? Offhand, I don't recall. That's wildly implausible, but moving on. Allow me to refresh your memory. Okay, we don't need to listen to him refresh your memory, but um, so this is Tom, the lawyer. He's representing uh, Sabrina slash Clarissa slash Melissa Joan Hart. And in connecting king's faith and his politics right here um he's bringing up the concept of political theology which is the idea that many political systems are secularized versions of theological beliefs now if that's true it would mean we can best understand contemporary politics by critiquing their underlying theological assumptions and he's correct to say that for mlk faith and politics were intertwined however king's actual politics are pretty at odds with the ones expressed in this film hold on uh so <clears throat> the idea of political theology again is uh, ex is expanded upon by um i think probably I have it. No. I do. This book. Um, this is my, my favorite book on political theology. This is... Um, hold on. Here, let me just do this. Uh, this is uh, William Kavanaugh's Migrations of the Holy, uh, God, State, and the Political Meaning of the Church. Uh, this is uh, essentially a uh, text on uh, what he's just describing, the replacement of uh, the, or I guess, well, to use, to use Kavanaugh's language, the migration of uh, theological ideas into the political arena and the political arena and also the, the, the cultural and the economic and all these other arenas, the secular arena, more or less. The... The migration of what we emphasize as our religious ideas into these other arenas. And so these other arenas take on the the tenor and character of our theological beliefs and our theological ideas. Um this is absolutely right, and I think that this this does in fact happen, and this is what this is what secularism sort of does. Uh you'll also see this in in philosophical uh philosophical uh treatises and ideas and and uh theories and such. Uh because often what you'll find is uh, secular or atheistic philosophers from a particular cultural background, uh, from a particular branch of Christianity, will have completely atheistic uh, ideas and systems, but those ideas and systems are very, very, very uh, uh, religiously colored. They are, they're shaped and formed by the philosophers of religious outlooks. The clearest example of this uh, would be somebody like Martin Heidegger, uh, who was a, uh, who was a Lutheran Oh gosh, what what? He was a seminary student. He may have been some kind of a missionary. I forget. I forget exactly. Uh, but he was a very devout Lutheran, and you can see his Lutheranism in his later atheistic, uh, atheistic philosophical outlooks, and in especially when you uh, get through the sort of later bits of being in time. But of course, you you see this sort of thing. It it is a kind of uh, kind of secularization of the sacred and. <clears throat> and when we when we see this sort of thing, it is, uh, and when we see political systems which are theological in nature, what they're what we're talking about here is is not what was happening with uh, with Dr. King, right? Maybe I should be up here for this. Right? Dr. King is a is a is first and foremost a uh, reverend. Historically speaking, he he had theological beliefs which impacted his political beliefs. That's very different from these ideas of political theology, where uh, where the, the the theological ideas lose their theological significance, and the same sort of general form or structure starts to inform the political. 
that's not what's going on with King, with Dr. King. Um, uh, Martin Luther King was a Christian who was involved with politics. What that means is that his theological ideas had impacts and influence on his political ideas. That's very, very different from the ideas of political the of uh, political theology. Uh, he's making a hell of a stretch here, and I don't I don't even know why he needs to do this other than to introduce a cool topic like political theology. Maybe it's just that because it is a cool topic. Like, don't get me wrong, it's a really cool topic. I'm glad he talks about it because it's a really cool thing to talk about. And again, I get to show off one of my favorite <laughs> one of my favorite books on the subject. Um, William Kavanaugh is brilliant, uh, brilliant. I guess political theorist, religious studies scholar, whatever. I don't know. I don't actually know. Senior research professor. There you go. The blurb, I guess. Um, but no, he's um, he's brilliant on the subject, and I and I and I really appreciate that that gets brought up here. But I think that it's wildly inappropriate when talking about Martin Luther King. I'm gonna go back down into the corner, into my corner down here, and uh, let's keep going. Let's see. Uh, because he's gonna he's gonna bring up a again a solid point about Dr. King, but not one that's particularly relevant to the movie. Maybe it is. I don't know. Uh, well, I'll see what, see what we have to say here. Like they aren't super subtle about showing their own political cards. I mean, Mike Huckabee is in this movie. See, King's actual politics are what conservative evangelicals would probably call woke socialism. And no. No. Socialism, yes. Woke, no. And we'll get back to why. Moving on. As King wrote in a letter to his wife, Coretta Scott King, I imagine you already know that I am much more socialistic in my economic theory than capitalistic. And it's very cool that he Correct. included that in a romantic letter to his wife. Um, and King's belief in democratic socialism and wealth redistribution was a direct outcome of his own Christian faith. As he said, call it democracy or call it democratic socialism, but there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country for all God's children. So don't tell Sabrina, but Jesus made MLK a socialist. Speaking of Sabrina. Okay. Uh, Jesus made MLK a socialist. Okay. It's dumb, but... There we go. That 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 that, that frame. This is perfect frame. <laughs> um, first of all, he would argue yes, but no. Um, he was a socialist for religious reasons, but uh, but those reasons were were uh, dubious to say the least. Um, now, uh, yes, economically speaking, uh, Martin Luther King was, was a socialist. He was, he was absolutely a socialist. He was absolutely a leftist, et cetera, et cetera. He was all these sorts of bad things that we should not like and we should not appreciate. Uh, his actual political outlook was, was insane and incredibly dangerous to the people he was trying to defend, uh, because that's how socialists necessarily work. That said, he was not what we would call woke. He was not intersectionalist. He was not a uh, he was not a postmodern or post-structuralist. He was not an egalitarian by any means at all. In fact, uh, in fact, I have seen very often woke people taking great offense to Martin Luther King quotes because those Martin because those quotes involve equ uh, involve equality rather than equity. Equity being the most important aspect that makes leftist politics in the modern period, quote, woke. Uh, that is, um, broadly speaking, what you would call equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity. Now, that's a really trite, simple, over, overly simplistic, straightforward way of saying it. But King was, uh, was not an egalitarian in that sense. He, hold, he held to the equality of man as, as brothers. Uh, as, as brothers and sisters, children of God, and, and again, this does come directly from his uh, from his religious faith. To be fair, so did his uh, so did his uh, his economic views. But those economic views were also were also just mired in misunderstandings of economics, like most socialists are. As for this whole brotherhood of man thing, you will not find that among the woke. Uh, socialists and the, the woke leftists of today. The woke leftists of today will hold to uh, strict racialism, will hold to race essentialism, will hold to uh, to um, things like what what philosophers will call leveling down egalitarianism. This is a technical term. Uh, so egalitarianism means that everyone should be equal. Us, and that means that everyone's material conditions should be equal, and that uh, within within some margin, usually this isn't necessarily completely flat, but it's within some margin. 
uh, that everyone's material conditions should be equal. Everyone's uh, everyone's uh, access to social uh, social services should be equal. Everyone's contributions to society should be equal, etc., etc., etc. And um, what you'll find in modern wokists is that they hold that um, that it is preferable that society be equal rather than society be prosperous. Uh, you can trace this back to um, John Rawls at least, uh, who held that, um, is, uh, was it the difference principle? I think it was called that, um, that, uh, uh, a benefit to the most well-off is fine. So long as it also benefits the least well-off. But the, um, th th this idea of course, is that the, uh, the, the idea involved is that of leveling down egalitarianism is that it is better for everyone to use a, a simple, straightforward example. Uh, it would be better for everyone to have um, a bank account with $100 in it than for uh, there to be a normal distribution curve uh, of people having uh, anywhere between $1,000 and $100 million in it. Uh, that, 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 that unequal distribution uh, is far worse than everyone's uh, inferior material conditions. Uh, in other words, uh, leveling down authoritarian, or not authoritarian, usually, but leveling down egalitarians, a Freudian slip there, uh, leveling down egalitarians will hold that uh, it is, uh, it can be a better condition even if no one in particular is actually better off, that everyone involved is actually worse off so long as everyone involved is closer to equal. That is the thing that, very precisely, that, that Dr. Kane opposed, opposed vehemently, uh, as well as race essentialism. He was absolutely not a raci racial essentialist like most modern wokists. Okay, let's continue and see what more he has to say here. Speaking of Sabrina, mid-trial, she has her lawyer over for Chinese food in what feels a little too much like a date. Listen, this isn't about faith. This is about history. Okay, maybe I'm wrong here. I'm not the law expert, but... Like a lawyer. I think they've missed but a lot of called, called lawyers. I'm, I'm not sure I follow. He talked about Jesus' teachings just like they were any other verifiable fact. Well, what if they're just that? I mean, just because certain facts happen to be recorded in the Bible doesn't mean they stop being facts. We can separate the history-based elements of Jesus' life from the faith-based element. Okay, um, this, this is like a weird move, and it further highlights a distinction between religious faith and historical knowledge in a way that completely undermines the former. Now, it's important to note that for most of Christian history... Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. He's about to say something horribly wrong, but I'm going to give him credit here. He's right, this is a really weird move. And it's not one that we should be, that I don't think a movie should like this should be making. Um, basically, it's trying to do this whole thing where we should, basically, it's trying to pull a Jefferson's Bible. So if you're familiar at all with Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's faith in particular, um, he had a copy of the Bible that he edited and annotated. Um, and he edited out all of the unverifiable and miraculous claims uh, in the entire New Testament but kept all of the historical accounts, um, the historical accounts, as well as the ethical precepts. Now, this is not something that Christians should be promoting, even in the least. Um, and this is what makes me think, makes me actually wonder whether the Melissa Jones Hart character is actually Christian or whether she was just <clears throat> historically quoting Jesus. Um, yeah, I don't know, because this doesn't seem like the kind of thing that a Christian would use to defend the faith. Uh, because, again, trying to separate this, the, the factual historical claims of Scripture from the, well, what we should think of as equally factual theological claims of Scripture, uh, but not historically verifiable, um, trying to separate these things is, is completely wrongheaded. These are, or should be, on the same footing. And so he's, I think, he's absolutely right. This is, the, this is a very weird take, a weird track for this movie to go down. Uh, and I don't know why they're doing it. Maybe, maybe to reflect some kind of court case in reality. I don't remember when this movie came out. Maybe it was talking about something that was in the news. Maybe it was doing something specific. Maybe like, I don't know, Lee Strobel's case for Christianity or that, whatever that was. Maybe it had something to do with that. I, I don't know. Suffice to say, it is absolutely a strange decision to sort of and conceptually separate these two things so starkly the 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 historical claims of uh from from the new testament from scripture 
uh, historically separating separating that off as factual versus the claims of faith or claims of theology. Yeah, I don't know why the movie's doing that, but uh, I disagree with it for very different reasons than he does. Let's, uh, yeah, let's see. And historical knowledge in a way that completely undermines the former. Now, it's important to note that for most of Christian history, faith wasn't dependent upon historical proof of the existence of Jesus. Faith involved an act of will and belief, not just in agreement with historical principles. Philosopher Immanuel Kant said that he found... Yeah, he's going to go to Immanuel, Immanuel Kant for expertise on Christianity. Okay, cool. Uh, so... <clears throat> Uh, let's let's hear this again because because he gets he gets he gets off track and then he gets on track and then he gets off track and then he gets on, on track and I want to I want to make sure we have a very good very careful reading of this to to pick this part a distinction between religious faith and historical knowledge in a way that completely undermines the former now it's important to note that for most of Christian history faith wasn't dependent upon historical proof of the existence of Jesus correct right okay so um, faith. Uh, faith as a theological virtue, or even faith just qua believing what the church teaches, or what the Bible teaches, or believing in Christianity and, and holding true to it, and all that. That wasn't dependent upon historical claims, right? These historical arguments for Christianity were very rare. Uh, they came up, but, uh, but they didn't happen very often. Usually it would be in the context of uh, the fulfillment of prophecy or uh, miraculous accounts that would be a source for faith. You'd see that in some of the lives of the saints, uh, where where saints would would tell these stories and it would would convert pagans because pagans would see this and would would take these um, uh, these these accounts of mira of the miraculous as evidence that your God is real and is powerful. Um, or you would see it in cases like Blaise Pascal. Blaise Pascal hold, held that the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies in Jesus was a very good reason to think that Jesus was actually the Messiah and actually the Son of God. But again, it wasn't about are the historical claims of the Old and New Testaments verifiable, like historically verifiable? Are these reliable historical sources? First of all, because academic history, as we know it today, is like 200 years old at most. And so, no, this kind of a question just wouldn't have come up, first of all. Like, no, people just assumed that ancient historians were doing something like what we were doing historically until a couple hundred years ago at the most. Uh, but even that aside, right? Even if even if there was a question of its authenticity, it didn't matter. That wasn't that wasn't the that wasn't the category. It was assumed, right? Rather than uh, these were historical sources and they were taken as as narrative histories rather than like rather than I guess journalism. I don't know. It, it's 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 a weird category mistake to think that this would have been um, a big deal historically. So he's right on track here. He's correct, but he's about to take a wrong turn. So here we go. Faith I'm involved an down. act of will and belief, not just in agreement with historical principles. Okay, right so far. Faith is an act of will because it is a virtue. It is, uh, it is, a, it is, a, 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 it is an action. It's a voluntary action. Okay. Okay. Haven't gone off the rails yet, but it's coming. Philosopher Immanuel Kant said that he found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Now okay, uh, no. Um, Immanuel Kant was an atheist, first of all. Well, I mean, he wasn't a Christian. Um... Deny knowledge to make room for faith. Uh, hold on. By this, he didn't mean that Christopher Immanuel Kant said that he found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Uh, no. What? Like, that's... Okay. Kant had a, a very strong conceptual separation between, uh, between <laughs> the empirically verifiable, that which is empirically verifiable to the senses in particular, um, and so that also, worth noting, does not include historical knowledge on the one hand. And on the other, uh, the, the numinous, uh, things that were, things that are either intuitive or, uh, or, uh, or supernatural or, f uh, faith or, uh, require faith or require testimony or that sort of thing. Things that are not verifiable by the senses. And so it was basically a kind of, um, it was following Rene Descartes in his split between the, 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 the material and the immaterial, but it's a conceptual separation of the, the imminent and the, and the numinous, the, I don't know the right terms. Forgive me, I'm not a Kantian, I don't, I'm not an expert on Kant. Um, but, again, I know enough to know that, that what he's talking about here is very different from what Wisecrack is talking about. So, so no, this is not the kind of conceptual separation that we're talking about, and even if it were the kind of conceptual separation that we're talking about here, it's Immanuel Kant, who cares? This is, who cares why, uh, who cares what somebody like Immanuel Kant thinks about the, the relationship between faith and knowledge? 
the relationship between faith and knowledge has always consistently been understood as as um as faith being a uh, a sort of uh, a sort of lower order of knowledge and then building upon knowledge that they have a reciprocal a reciprocal and uh, dynamic relationship rather than uh, rather than a competitive relationship like he's putting forward let's continue and see where else he goes off the rails because we're already wobbling on the tracks now by this he didn't mean that faith was irrational or for gullible people but that faith and knowledge are categorically distinct trying to comprehend faith via knowledge would be like tasting a pinot noir with your toes but category error um and not just because just because he's he's talking about sense sense perception um, but it's category error here because, again, faith and knowledge do not have distinct sources. They are both aspects of the mind. So uh, this goes back, this is a distinction that goes back to Plato. Um, Plato would have called faith simply belief, uh, or pistis. Uh, and this is... Uh, they're both faculties of the rational intellect. Um, pistis and episteme, or knowledge, knowledge of, of, um, uh, of uh, relationships. So pistis belief is uh, is the is ideas about particular things, and it's very imminent knowledge. It's a very imminent kind of knowing and kind of understanding. It, it, not understanding. Understanding isn't correct, um, but it's a low level of knowledge because it is purely about particulars. It it doesn't abstract. It's uh, it's also fundamentally uncertain because it's about particulars. Particulars can change. Whereas knowledge is about the relationships between particulars and their forms, and the relationships between different forms. Um, this is more certain knowledge. This is more abstract knowledge. This is more generalized knowledge. And it's knowledge uh, which is developed from, in a lot of cases at least, uh, what we know by belief, what we come to believe through our sense experience and such. And from the top down, from our understanding to uh, sort of particularizing our, our understanding of things. Again, look at my, my various uh, lectures on uh, Plato's allegory of the line, um, simile of the line, whatever, um, allegory of the line, um, which goes into the relationship between, between uh, belief and knowledge. It's not a different type of faculty like he's trying to put it out lay it out to be it is that belief or faith is a sort of lower order knowledge at least initially which then we can then uh further justify etc so it's not again it's not oppositional but it's also not this complete separation kind of thing like he's saying it is Let's back up a second and let's keep going. Categorically distinct. Trying to comprehend faith via knowledge would be like tasting a Pinot Noir with your toes. But the lawyer goes all in on proving Jesus. He puts some witnesses on the stand, non-actors playing themselves, and has them testify about why Jesus absolutely existed. And that, he argues, confirms the validity of the Christian faith. I kind of dig this uh, as an element of, this, of these movies where they just kind of get apologists. Not necessarily the greatest apologists, but they just kind of get apologists to give talks as part of their movies and they come up with reasons to do it. That's kind of neat. I'm a sucker. I'm a sucker for that sort of, I'm a sucker for just in just unnecessarily inserting philosophy talks into, into movies. Then again, I, I almost like Alice Shrugged just a little bit. So, I mean, I ran has got problems, but I like the format. Anyway, moving on. Sorry. I had to interrupt. Can you help me prove the existence of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Actually, this court already affirmed it when we were called into session and the date was given. Our calendar has been split between BC and AD based on the birth of Jesus, which is quite a feat if he never existed. Beyond that, I feel like that's not a good Gary argument. <laughs> okay, so first of all, uh, okay, a couple things. First of all, almost no reputable historian denies the existence of Jesus. Uh, even um, Paul, not Paul Ehrlich. Yeah, Paul Ehrlich. I think. Whatever his name is, Ehrlich, whatever his, last, whatever his name is, the, but um, um, who who had held, who had at some point held that the idea of Jesus was was a myth, that Jesus was mythological, uh, has dismissed that claim and recant and sort of backpedaled and said that the supernatural claims about Jesus were mythical and added upon added on later due to the unreliable uh, nature of historical texts in that time period, um, and of course you can completely. Uh, the problem with his arguments are, are manifold, but but most notably, Bart Ehrman, that's it, Bart Ehrman, not Paul Ehrlich, different guy, different wrong person, but Bart Ehrman. Um, 
the primary problem with his argument is that it winds up disproving the existence of Alexander the Great. So, you know, because if we can't rely on ancient histories for, for actual claims and historical claims like this, then, well, we can't rely on, uh, like, you know, we can't rely on ancient histories like the New Testament for beliefs about Jesus, or ideas for the like, historical accounts of Jesus, then why would we believe ancient histories about anything else when those textual, when those bits of textual evidence are far, far more distant? Like most of the Roman emperors, we have far less evidence for than we have for Jesus. Okay, next up. No, no. The wisecrack here is, is, is sort of denigrating this idea of our calendar, of the Gregorian calendar being separated into AD and BC. Um, first of all, surprised that he didn't pull out the, the common era before the common era canard, but whatever. Um, this is actually a far better argument than, than that he gives credit. Uh, that he gives credit for, um, that this is a, this has a sort of historical footing, right? There is a, there is a, there is an historical basis for, uh, the dating of this calendar and it goes back pretty far. Uh, now it doesn't go all the way back to like, it's not like Jesus was born and then they just started saying, ah, yes, it is now one, uh, the year of our Lord one, um, the Gregorian calendar was not implemented until the, uh, what was it, ninth century, eighth century, something like that, at least in the West. Could be wrong. Uh, actually, I think I'm a little later than that. But the point being that the Ju even the Julian calendar before that uh, still held to the Anno Domini um, dating schema, <laughs> which again is historically based, and it is it is based on tracing the um, tracing the annals of history back to the birth of Christ. Uh, and so again, this this is a good bit of historical evidence for um, for ancient dates of uh, of Christ's birth and Christ's life. So this is not something that should just be dismissed. Now, the court having acknowledged it by saying by you know giving the date, okay, it's a little bit of a stretch. I don't think that would pass muster in a court of law, but but who cares? It is actually a much more it's a much more decent argument. Uh, then, then he's giving it credit for it by dismissing it. Anyway, that's a count. There's 39 ancient sources for Jesus. As the agnostic historian Bart Ehrman says, Jesus did exist, whether we like it or not. Okay, that's what I was just talking about, Bart Ehrman, who used to hold that Jesus was a myth, but no longer does. He has actually he's walked that back, and because of all of the contemporary sources, the ancient contemporary sources, uh, for at least the historicity of Jesus. Like it, it's almost uncontested in academia that Jesus lived and certain facts about his life were, were held with almost absolute certainty that, that he was, uh, that he was held to be a Messiah figure, that he was martyred by, uh, by the, the Roman authorities in Judea, by Pontius Pilate, uh, all these, these, these chronological bits of history and that he inspired a movement called Christians very quickly called the Catholic church. All of these things are historically verifiable and almost no one denies them so yeah i mean this is the part that he should be addressing not the well, the calendar doesn't actually mean that, that jesus was born come on man you're better than this i hope i put it this way denying the existence of jesus I mean, doesn't don't make him go turn away. to the jury like that it merely proves you can't that do no that. amount of evidence will can he's talking over it again first of all second of all who cares it's a movie Yes, I presumably you, witnesses don't turn to the jury like that. Like that's the judge can, but I don't think witnesses can directly address the jury. But again, it's dramatic. The music is swelling. That's kind of the whole point of it being a movie. If courtrooms, let me put it this way: if courtroom scenes in movies were like courtroom scenes in real life, like beat for beat, no one would put them in their movies. Because no one actually watches courtrooms, courtroom scenes, like actual courtroom footage, except for a few very niche people who are particularly interested in that sort of thing in particular, which is not the market for mass media, a uh, like general release movie. Sorry. It's nitpicking and you're talking over him. Stop. It's not a thing. 
Okay, um, okay. Any kind well, of I am by no means a theologian. I'm actually decently well read in the history of Christian theology, and I can pretty confidently say that for many of the great minds of the Judeo Christian tradition, belief was never about evidence, it was about faith. Augustine uh, was one of the. What does that mean? Belief is not about evidence, it's about faith. Okay. He's about to talk about Augustine. Move back up here. He's going to be horribly wrong, and I'm going to yell at him, but belief isn't about evidence, it's about faith. Okay. The phrase, belief is about faith, is a simple, straightforward tautology. They're the same word in Greek. They're the same word in Latin. They are the same word. English has two different words for it because they have two different languages of origin. That's it. That is the only reason. There, there's no other reason to have belief and faith be separated. Conceptually speaking, they are the same concept. So belief is about faith means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Now, if by that you mean... You're going to like spin this out a lot and say that belief is about the possession of the theological virtue of faith. And by belief here, we mean being a Christian is about possessing the theological virtue of faith. That's kind of true, but it's also still not true because possessing a particular virtue is not is neither necessary nor sufficient for uh, for Christian belief, which again is a very Protestant notion, and he's going in the, the he's going into the hi the history of Christianity, going back to Augustine, and holding to a, this Protestant notion of being a Christian is about belief as well, which is it's again it's it's not being a Christian is about being baptized. Being baptized has the precondition of uh, well, under 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 normal adult circumstances, has the precondition of believing certain uh, believing the creed. But that's not the only that's not the only precondition either. It's also repent, repent and be baptized. Repentance, it, it's a it's a it's an ethical thing as well. It's a it's a ritual thing. It's not about just believe these propositions and therefore you call yourself a Christian. It's none of this. Um. So hold on. Let me go back a second uh, once again and uh, <clears throat> let me rehear that sentence because there was something else wrong with it. I think so. Let's let's pick at it. For many of the great minds of the Judeo-Christian tradition, belief was never about evidence, it was about faith. Augustine uh, was one of the hey, To say that belief is not about evidence is also silly, it's also ridiculous. There were there were a great many preambles of faith uh, held by Augustine, held by Aquinas, held by Anselm, held by every Christian theologian who has ever lived before, at least before the Protestant Reformation. At least, let me, let me put it this way. Every Christian theologian that I'm familiar with in my area of study which is the scholastic period of roughly 500 to 1500. Every single one of them held that there were certain preambles of faith. That is, things that you could and should come to believe and come to know through evidence, through arguments, and did not need revelation to be certain about. These include the existence of God. This is Catholic dogma that... The existence of God is not an article of faith. That is, that is to say, that uh, it is Catholic dogma that a Catholic must believe on pain of excommunication. That revelation is not needed to believe, to have a reason for believing that God exists, because otherwise that would be viciously circular. Obviously. The Bible says the Bible is true, yeah, etc. Right? Of course, it would be viciously circular. Uh, rather, um, again, it is Catholic dogma to to hold that that the existence of God can be demonstrated through natural reason alone. Okay, the belief in this context, belief in Christianity, belief that God exists and that Christianity is true, is a matter not of simple choice, which is what he's going to argue because. He knows Kierkegaard. We're going to talk about Kierkegaard. Uh, it's not a matter of choice, right? B belief in this context, believing that Christianity is true, is a matter of evidence and argument, of coming to a rational conclusion that, that Christianity is true. And I can't believe he's going to try and rope Augustine into thinking this. Uh, mm. One of the first big deal Christian theologians. And he thought that faith had to precede reason. Basically, by believing in God, via No, absolutely not. There is a sense in which faith precedes reason, but it's not the sense that he's going to talk about. So let's uh, go ahead, go ahead. Let's see. 
pure faith, you're better theologians. And he thought that faith had to precede reason. Basically, by believing in God via pure faith, you're better able to gain knowledge of truth because God sort of shines a light to help you. As he said in his confessions, which Usher later named an album after, the mind needs to be enlightened by light from outside itself so that it can participate in truth because it is not itself the nature of truth. You will light my lamp, Lord. So in trying to use reason to justify faith, my childhood crush seems to have things a little backwards. There okay. Reason does justify faith. So here's, here's where we're going with this. It is a feedback loop. Put it in sort of modernist terms. Um, what we have is, um, he's, he, okay, so he's partially right about Augustine here. And there's a better text to look to this. It is um, Augustine's dialogue on the teacher. Uh, the, the full title of which is, I believe, On Christ the Inner Teacher. Uh, and it's, an, it's, a, it's a text on, um, on epistemology, broadly speaking. And it's the idea that these things have to be um, dynamic. They have to be a, uh, a back and forth kind of built upon each other. Uh, and this is because you have to begin with, uh, with understanding, with knowledge, with learning. You have to learn. You have to come to the conclusion that, that Christianity is true and that I can place my faith in God. Because you can't place your faith in God if you don't believe God exists. And the only way to believe God exists is either to place your faith in God, which, again, we've noticed is already viciously circular, or you have to know that God exists in order to place your faith in God. By placing your faith in God, then, then, this process that he's talking about kicks off, that, that Christ, um, just like Christ is, in, is infused into us as, uh, as the infused virtues, as the, the infused character virtues, um, that that we are that, that we 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 receive uh, we receive a a reconstituted will right? because again we 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 have uh, we bear the stain of original sin and so that means we have what's called concupiscence we have we have this ongoing temptation we have the inclination towards sin and through baptism and the sacraments we receive Christ and it is uh, it is through receiving Christ through receiving this perfect and uncorrupt human nature that we are then. Uh, we are then ordered and directed towards the good once again okay because the good and the true are equivalent they are the same thing they're 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 uh, they're convertible they're transcendental qualities they're the same in god when we receive christ we also receive this inclination now towards the truth we receive uh, right christ is the analogy the analogy he uses which is similar to the one from the confessions but this is from uh, 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 from De Magistro, from on the teacher, um, Christ is sort of the is seen as the the light from within, which illuminates that which we uh, that which we understand and that which we seek to understand. So again, it is a feedback process. You begin with understanding, right? you begin with with knowledge, with finding things out. You begin by discovering that God is that God is real. And that it is right and just to place one's faith in God. Then one places one's faith in God. Then God grants one the internal light of Christ, which then allows us to fully understand, gradually, the mysteries, that is, um, uh, the, the, the mysteries of the faith that we could not have understood on our, on our own. We can also take this another way. We can look at this in terms of, uh, in terms of natural theology and revealed theology. We have the preambula fide, the the preambles of faith, uh, which can be understood through the through the natural light of human reason, but and that gets you to Christianity is true. Then you have the uh, you have the revealed theology, which can only be known and only be understood through revelation of Christ and believing in God in that sense, having faith. This is so an example of the first. Uh, of natural theology would come, be coming to the conclusion that Christianity is true, coming to the conclusion that uh, that. Uh, God is one, that God exists and is one, uh, that, that there is only one God, that monotheism is true, things like that. Revealed theology would be things like God is Trinity. Revealed theology would be things like the particular, uh, the particular uh, uh, sacramental steps of redemption, things like this, things that we could not have known if God had not directly told us. Now, 
this is again a a multiple step process. We start with these preamble of fide, these 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 uh, preambles of faith, the the bits of natural theology that we can understand on our own, and then that gradually means that we can come to be Christian, come to place our faith in God. When we place our faith in God, God grants us this additional knowledge and grants us this revelation. Then we can gradually come to more fully understand the mysteries of the faith. It's not just this idea that what he's saying here, which is that faith is a choice which then will lead to understanding. He is horrifyingly misinterpreting the uh, the, the the little uh, the little locution from uh, from Saint Anselm, um, uh, "Fides quaerunt intellectum," faith seeking understanding. <clears throat> Yes, faith seeking understanding. I have faith, and then I seek to understand what I what it is that I believe. But the reason you have faith in the first place is because you've come to a conclusion that it must be true, and then you have to believe that it's true, place your faith in God, place your trust in God, and then from there continue um, c continue the journey to understand to understand the nature of what it is that you've come to believe. Right? You can <coughs> excuse me. You can come to believe that God exists and not comprehend very much at all about the divine nature. Because of course you can't, because the divine nature is infinitely complicated and, infinite, and infinitely simple in another respect. It's, it's incomprehensible to the finite human mind. And so if you're going to believe that God exists, you can believe that God exists based on natural reason. Say, you know, you, you read Anselm's ontological argument and clicks, right? Fine. Then you read the rest of the monologia and you start to start to understand the complex theology of God, having already come to believe that God exists. That's what he's talking about. It's not that you just make this arbitrary choice to believe and then, and then you sort of post hoc justify it, which is his implication here. That's, that's fideism and it's heresy. Hey, let's see how long it takes for him to get to Kierkegaard, which is where this whole idea comes from. Then there's medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas, whose family uh, kidnapped him for a year and whose brothers hired sex workers to try to sway him from joining the Dominican order. Whores. They're called whores. And he, they did, in fact, do this. This is actually true. Just some fun facts. Anyway, he thought that faith was a sort of middle point between knowledge and opinion. For Aquinas, when thinking theologically... Hold on. Hold on. Let me get the chart. Let me look at the chart. Let me look at the chart. Just some fun facts. Anyway, he thought that faith was a sort of middle point between... Okay. Yes. That chart, that chart is from Plato. Except it should go vertically. So opinion is, uh, is the lowest part of the divided line. Opinion is about images. It is about imitations of reality. Faith, or belief, is about particular things. Knowledge is about abstract principles, the relationships between forms and the relationships between objects and their forms. What makes a particular thing the kind of thing that it is? Then above that, you have what's called understanding. Understanding is knowledge of the forms. What are the things in the world and how do they work fundamentally in an abstract sort of way? This, this little, this little chart here is missing an extra step because it's intentionally misrepresenting what Aquinas is talking about. Aquinas here is just talking about the Platonic, the Platonic epistemology, which the sort of chain of understanding, which reaches its culmination in being itself qua God. That's what he's talking about. This is not a sort of like faith then culminates in knowledge sort of, not that, like even slightly. From joining the Dominican Order. Okay. Some fun facts. Anyway, he thought that faith was a sort of middle point between knowledge and opinion. For Aquinas, when thinking theologically, you start from a place of faith. That what about opinion? You just said faith is a middle ground between opinion and knowledge. What about opinion? Don't you start with opinion and then go to faith? You're losing. You're you're, you're losing it, man. Losing it. Because again, because this is nonsense. This is a gross misinterpretation of Aquinas, and I think it's intentional at this point. It almost has to be. You absolutely do not start with faith for Aquinas. Like, read any, any, any point, any question in the Summa Theologiae, and you will find in a, uh, one of the objections will be, this seems to be an article of faith. We receive this knowledge from God. <coughs> um, 
And then, uh, and then there will be a reply to that objection, saying that no, we can and should come to this knowledge uh, through the light of human reason. And there is no need for, uh, for revelation to understand this. Almost every question has at least one objection of that sort. If not every question, at least every, at least every topic. This is wildly disingenuous. It drives me insane knowledge and opinion. For Aquinas, when thinking theologically, you start from a place of faith, then proceed to try to understand that faith through reason. Theology, then, for him, is faith-seeking understanding. Faith. Again, that's just trying, trying desperately to quote Anselm. Uh, Aquinas does quote Anselm, but this is, again, not what he's talking about. He's talking about what I was just talking about before with what Anselm was talking about. Faith does, in fact, seek understanding, but first, we must have, uh, we must come to conclusions in order to have faith. Faith here just means belief. It is the same word in Latin. It's just fides. Moving on. Proceed to try to understand that faith through reason. Theology then for him is faith seeking understanding. Faith thus leads us on a journey to knowledge by planting a seed in our minds. And for Aquinas, faith isn't determined by reason. Rather, it requires a commitment grounded in belief. And 20th... <laughs> oh my God. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. This is the first thing he said. He's actually put on a chart that was correct. Hold on. For Aquinas, faith isn't determined by reason. Rather, it requires a commitment grounded in Here we go. Faith equals belief. That's correct. You've posted a tautology. Good job. God. Okay, so... Let me see what he says about this. I wasn't paying attention. I was looking at the charts. Let me go back to that. Knowledge by planting a seed in our minds. And for Aquinas, faith isn't determined by reason. Rather, it requires a commitment grounded in belief. Commitment grounded in belief. Yeah, that's that's true. It's just belief is not arbitrary. Belief is grounded in reason. So, yes, faith is grounded in, is not grounded in reason. It's grounded in belief. It's a commitment based on belief. Well, yeah, it's a commitment based on belief. If faith were, if what faith here means is the theological virtue, then yes, it is on the ba it's it's on the basis of belief. But belief here is not just arbitrary; it's not a choice. Faith is a choice. Belief is intellectual. I, 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 mean, I can go further. I can be even more mean to him, and point out that for Aquinas, even choices are intellectual. Uh, making a choice for Thomas Aquinas is determining what is the good. What is the highest good in a given situation, in a given in a given circumstance? And so, if you if you determine that, uh, even even on this model, right, on this model, taking taking Wisecrack's interpretation whole hog here, that that faith is entirely a choice. Even then, for Thomas Aquinas, because Aquinas, Aquinas is an intellectualist with respect to to free choice, what that means then is that. The choice of what to believe, the choice of faith, is simply and straightforwardly determined by what the intellect, what the intellect determines is, uh, is uh, the, the highest good available in, in, in a given circumstance. And so what that means, essentially, because we're talking about intellectual virtue here, is that if, you're, if you are making a choice, if the will is choosing faith... What that simply and straightforwardly means is that the intellect is determining that what you have faith in is true. Come on, man. Like, get... You're trying so hard. And I, God, I really think at this point... I didn't think this on the first time through, but now taking the time and carefully analyzing this, I'm starting to think that he is... He is either terribly ignorant about everybody outside of his very particular wheelhouse and so therefore he's just reading aquinas and augustine for that matter in light of kierkegaard or he's being willfully disingenuous to support his thesis which is i hate to admit a thing that philosophers will do sometimes it's disgusting i hate it when we do it i hate it when i do it i've done it before shame to admit it but i've done it we've all done it we shouldn't Arguing in bad faith. And I'm beginning to think this might... Okay, so this is either a bad faith argument, or I'll give him an out. He could just be... He could just have no idea whatsoever what Augustine or Aquinas even said. And he's just reading Kierkegaard into, into these theologians of the past. 
without them without understanding that Kierkegaard's positions are are considered heretical. Okay. I'm getting tired. Let's go. And 20th century theologian Paul Tillich said that faith is the state of being ultimately concerned. Okay. That is part of his definition of religion, not of faith. So Paul Tillich was barely a Christian. Um, he was he was a Lutheran at, at one point, but he also dabbled with atheism. He was far more of a religious studies scholar than he was a theologian per se. He argued that uh, that we should define religion as utmost concern. Whatever our utmost concern is, that's what we take to be religion. That's what we place our faith in. And so this argument was about including, say, political systems in in the domain of religion. Uh, because if you are, if you take politics to be your utmost concern, to be your your chief concern, your your that than which no greater can be thought. <clears throat> if you take the political as your determinant of reality, as your, as your archon, then what that just means, therefore, is that that is your religion. That's what Tillich was talking about here. He's not talking about faith in in the sense of in the sense of choosing what to believe. Again, this is a gross misinterpretation, and I, I almost think it has to be intentional. Deliberate with an intentional. Which means that faith is more of an existential commitment than a matter of rational knowledge. As far as I know, none of these theologians were like, if we dig up Jesus' bones, then we can prove he was real, and all the skateboarder kids will start going to church. You're an idiot. That would disprove Christianity. You, you know that, right? If you dug up Jesus' bones... I mean, this is a pons This is, this is, this is, there is no, there's, there is no significance to this point. It's just, this was obviously scripted. This is not an impromptu response like I'm doing. He thought this was a good point. Like, I, I really hope he realizes that if, if we today, if archaeologists were to find and confirm Jesus' bones, that that would disprove the resurrection, which would undermine Christianity. I don't even, I don't, I'm not even sure that he realizes that. Like, I don't know if this is a joke or not, but that's, that's just gratuitous. That's, that's absurd. Painfully absurd. But let's get back to the courtroom where the next witness is a cop. Which makes sense because Roman cops killed Jesus. And as a devout Christian, you feel yeah, you yes. succeeded? No, oh, Mr. Kane. I think you misunderstand me. When I began this study, I was a devout atheist. I began examining the gospel. He's a devout atheist. atheist. Not as a believer. I'm simply a Christian because it's evidentially true. Okay, um, so this makes me think of my guy, Soren Kierkegaard. Of course, everything should make you think of Soren Kierkegaard. Everything obviously makes you think of Soren Kierkegaard because that's the only person, it's the only theologian that you're probably going to interpret anything like correctly. He was a fideist. Um, ah, God. The reason this makes him think of Kierkegaard is because Kierkegaard would not have liked this argument. The trouble is that every theologian that he has cited up until this point, with the possible exception of Paul Tillich, would have liked this argument. That evidence led him to a particular conclusion about that, that Christianity is true, that God exists, and that he is capable, that he then can put his faith in, in God. In Christian, and put his faith in Christ, and all that stuff, right? I, I, I. Who referred to faith as an objective uncertainty held fast in an appropriation process of the most passionate inwardness. I'll explain. Now, I've talked before about his oft-quoted line, truth is subjectivity, which for Kierkegaard meant that something is only true for you if you appropriate that truth into your life in an active and passionate way. I okay, There's a couple of things about this. First of all, <clears throat> um, Kierkegaard's essay, Truth is Subjectivity, is not quite as relativistic as it sounds, but it's very close. And it's, no, it's very little surprise to me that he takes this to be uh, basically gospel about the Christian faith. Um, even though, again, this condemned heresy all over the place. Uh, fideism is officially condemned. Uh, existentialism is not, but, um, but relativism is condemned. Uh, so, uh, again, all of this is wildly non-Christian. Um, so, let me go back to his Kierkegaard quote. Let me pull this apart. Okay. 
objective uncertainty. Okay, so fate, objective uncertainty. Held fast in, uh, in an appropriation process of the most passionate inwardness. Okay, so it is true. It is true for me in, in Kierkegaard's sense, which is not how he puts it, but that's how Wisecrack puts it. So it is true for me because I, uh, I, uh, I, I appropriate this uncertainty into my life in my most passionate inwardness, so to speak. So what this, what this functionally means is uh, that it's objectively uncertain. I cannot know. I cannot come to a rational conclusion. Um, and for Kierkegaard, it's actually important that we can't come to a rational conclusion. Uh, because if we could, then it wouldn't be faith. And if it weren't faith, then it wouldn't be morally significant. Because he thinks that, uh, that, that the mind is automatically drawn to certainty. Right? If, if, if we can come to a certain conclusion about something, uh, an objective certainty, uh, then there's no choice about whether to believe it or not. It just, you just believe it. And so what he actually calls for in this essay, In Truth and Subjectivity, he, he calls for this uh, for, for avoiding arguments for and against God's existence and instead the radically free choice of what to believe. He was, a, again, an early existentialist. He held that one ought to choose what to believe, not, um, not in light of evidence, but intentionally and deliberately and, uh, and willfully even ignoring evidence. I have huge objections to this, and I don't actually, I don't even teach this anymore because this is already the assumption of everyone who thinks a little bit about religion, but not a very, not very much. This is already the cultural standard for, you know, 20th century Christians and atheists, basically 20th century college students. Um, we are all existentialists before we do any thinking about it. Um, and again, so it has to be objective uncertainty, so we can't be certain about it, and it has to be internally appropriated. Um, and so this, this faith is... Uh, is taking taking within oneself, uh, the, making the choice to believe in the face of uncertainty, and the 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 radical free choice of making this uh, of taking this in, taking this in into oneself, <coughs> um, uh, is what makes it real and significant, meaningful. Excuse me. Oh, uh, sorry about that. You can, of course, make this, uh, you can sort of read this in continuity with something like Blaise Pascal, who held that uh, to believe something is to act upon it, right? He, 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 he very closely tied belief in action, that, uh, that if you don't act on something, then you don't really believe it. Um, and this is where the whole discourse on the machine comes in. Again, I've got lectures on that too. In any case, though, it's, it, if we want to be overly charitable and, and try and let Kierkegaard avoid heresy, which, whatever, um, then we can say something like that, that, that the, the, the internalization of a belief is what makes it significant for oneself. But he goes further than that. That's, he, he says that's what makes it true, uh, at least from one's own perspective, which I think goes far, goes much, much too far. Anyway, all right, let's, uh, let's, let's see what more he has to say about Kierkegaard, because again, I think that, I think that we have, we've found, we've found what Wisecrack actually thinks, because I think that, 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 Based on what he has said so far, he is most familiar with Kierkegaard out of anybody in Christian history, and he basically thinks that Kierkegaard is representative of the entire Christian tradition, and so he just reads other Christian theologians in light of Kierkegaard. That's what I'm seeing here. Yes. I'll explain. Now, I've talked before about his off-quoted line, truth is subjectivity, which for Kierkegaard meant that something is only true for you if you appropriate that truth into your life in an active and passionate way, i.e. a religion isn't true because an ex-LAPD officer wrote a book that says it is. It's true when it changes your life and the way you live. Another off-discussed Kierkegaardian notion is the leap of faith. For him, this means that we can't rationally justify the choice to believe. He's going to misinterpret this. I'm going to head him off. Um, so Kierkegaard does not think that you can't rationally justify um, the existence of God. He thinks that you shouldn't. As I said this before, I brought this up before, that, that Kierkegaard does not think that proof is impossible. He thinks that it's counterproductive. That in order to have faith in God, there must be a gap to leap over, so to speak. So if you are going to make the sort of leap, leap of faith, I'm going to move again, um, if you are going to make the leap of faith, what that means is there has to be a gap to leap over. You have to, there has to be uncertainty. And so what that means is that you, you should 
you should be you should put yourself in a position so that you have to, to make this radically free choice about what to believe because if um if instead you have solid evidence for a conclusion, what that means is you're not radically free anymore. Your choice is not free. It is constrained by reality. Reality is sort of imposing itself upon you. You can see why Kierkegaard was sort of the father of existentialism. Maybe. Um, I can. Um, let me go into that, though. Uh, the point, though, right, the point I'm getting at here is that is that it's not that Kierkegaard thought that proof is impossible. It's that he thought that proof was counterproductive to being a Christian, which is wrong, because it, fideism is, again, condemned heresy, but I can... But again, it's not a... It's not saying that we can't prove that God exists. It's, it's saying that proof for God's existence is uh, not just unuseful, but counterproductive. That's what he's getting at here. We notion is the leap of faith. For him, this means that we can't rationally justify the choice to believe. We must take a leap of faith that transcends objective reason. Faith isn't agreeing with a proposition. It's passionately leaping into something uncertain. This applies equally well to non-religious situations. For example, okay. Um, he's right about that. He's right about that. Um, technically, that is correct. So faith is not believing in a proposition. I, I would actually wholeheartedly agree. Uh, faith is kind of trust. So it, as a virtue, it's it's the intellectual equivalent of courage, rough, roughly speaking. Um, <clears throat> I've um, <clears throat> I've gone into this a lot more in a um, in another response video that I've done to a to a street epistemology video. Uh, again, it's the first first video in my Preambula Fide uh, playlist. My playlist about uh, sort of the philosophy of religion, sort of introducing the philosophy of religion. Um, so if you haven't seen that, I I, I recommend it because it go, I go into the details of faith a lot more, but. But he's but he's onto he's onto something here that faith is not a uh, an affirmation of a proposition. That, that that that's not what makes one Christian. That's not what uh, that's not what having faith means. Faith means having means placing one's means consciously and deliberately placing one's trust in someone or something. In this case, placing one's trust in God, in the religious context. But again, that's not exactly what Kierkegaard is talking about. Kierkegaard is talking about. Um, consciously choosing to uh to internalize a particular belief and and allow it to guide one's actions it is still about a proposition it's just about the practical consequences of that proposition rather than uh, rather than a relationship with a person so he's he's still off he, when he almost has a point he's still a bit off with it opposition it's passionately leaping into something uncertain this applies equally well to doesn't have to be uncertain either, by the way. Faith, faith does not have to be uncertain. Faith can be absolutely certain, and it should be absolutely certain, because the basis of faith should be knowledge. And you, you, for example, if you were to be be faithful to say your wife, what that means is you you place your dedication and trust for very good reasons. Right? Yeah, you probably have very good reasons for being in love with your wife. And hell, being in love is a great reason to be faithful, to place one's one's continuous trust, trust and devotion. There, of course, can be reasons for doing so. Whether those are rational, irrational, irrational, or whatever, they are still reasons, and they are still uh, they're practical reasons. They're they are they're arguments for a particular conclusion, if we want to put it that way. So yeah, you know, there's. It's not just this. Like in, in reality, it's not just the security guardian radical free choice. It isn't agreeing with a proposition. It's passionately leaping into something uncertain. This applies equally well to non-religious situations. For example, in entering a relationship or committing to marriage, there is no way to rationally prove that someone is the one or that the marriage will last. So any love relationship requires a similar leap of faith. Interesting. Again, that's a, it's a decision to act in a certain way. It's not so much a decision to believe something. So again, it's a, that's that's again that's that's a stretch. Um, you, he's still stretching things here. Interestingly enough, Kierkegaard was inspired by people in his day who were doing the same thing as these witnesses, relying on logic and objectivity rather than faith to justify their belief in God. And he found this incredibly ironic, making him. I wonder why people were doing that. Could it be that that is the natural way that the Christian tradition has always done things, always since the beginning of the Christian tradition? Could that be possible that Kierkegaard was an outlier? 
Yes, yes, that's possible. That is actually what happened. The Alanis Morissette of 19th century Copenhagen. Okay, so spoiler uh, alert, but MJ Hart's character doesn't get the death penalty. She's found not guilty of whatever it was she was charged with, but not before her lawyer Tom absolutely freaks the f out. I think it's time that we stop pretending that we can trust a person like this to serve in a public capacity. In the name of tolerance and diversity, I say we destroy her. And if they don't pay, then we seize their property. And if they resist, well, let's not kid ourselves. Enforcement is always at the end of a gun. Okay, he's laughing, but... Okay, so this is, this is actually a really standard libertarian critique of government, state. Enforcement is always at the barrel of a gun. That is just, that's just tautologically true, right? So that's... The, the go-to example of this is, suppose you get a speeding ticket. You get a speeding ticket. Okay, great. What do you do? Well, you can go to court. Okay, what if you don't? You don't go to court. Okay. Uh, you'll get a summons. <clears throat> okay. Uh, then you don't respond to the summons. Okay. Uh, your, your account will be tarnished. Well, what if you don't have a bank account? What if you have cash? Well, eventually, you will be physically arrested. And if you refuse to be arrested, what happens? The barrel of a gun. Any law, any law in the books, is ultimately enforced with lethal violence. Uh, and then, so this is, this, is, this is, again, a really, really standard point. Uh, a, an obviously true point of, of uh, libertarian legal theory. Like, there's, there's nothing that should be controversial about this. I mean, it's a hell of a realization to make, but there's nothing controversial about this. And he's going to treat this as absolutely ridiculous. Even though, again, this is just obviously and uncontroversially true. He's going to make a different point out of this, but I, I, I need to point that out. That it's very important that, to realize that the lawyer here is just straightforwardly correct. Anyway. Okay. Um, friends, enemies, trolls, I assure you that no matter what your religion or lack thereof, no American government agent is going to show up to your house and, and make you look down the barrel of a gun because of your religious belief. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, there, there are counterexamples of that. Definitely counterexamples to that. Oh, hold on, hold on. 2021. Dude, dude. Like, okay. Come on. Uh, there were... How can you say this in the year of our Lord, 2021? There were people in the U.S. who were arrested with guns for practicing their faith in the year this was made the, oh my god so the for, I, i'm referring to lockdown orders right i'm referring to covid lockdown orders that churches were closed down etc and yet people did people did what they were supposed to do according to their religion anyway because it was made illegal people showed up with guns and threatened to and pointed those guns at them to stop them this happened in this country, and especially in the one a little bit north of us, that, that one, that one, that one more so, the, the whole America's hat place, having a lot more up there. But regardless, in this country, this happened in the year this video was made. Like, dude, man, I don't even have to go to, uh, to more outlandish examples of like, okay, well, what about, uh, what about if you're, um, what if you're, uh, you're, religious your religious obligations conflict with the tax code or what if your religious obligations mean that you uh, to go back a few more years what if your religious obligations mean that you uh, you cannot uh, you cannot um, let's say bake a gay wedding cake how about that well that seems to be against the law I mean it's not but it people with guns still wound up getting involved like dude you you do not. I, I, the, the lack of self-awareness in this incredulity is unbelievable. I'm almost as incredulous about his incredulity as he is about the idea of, of anti-religious laws being enforced with guns. Like, of course there are. Of course there are. In the U.S., more so in Canada, obviously, but even in the U.S., this happens regularly. Dude. Beliefs. Now, this is actually part of a real thing called the Evangelical Persecution Complex. It's been written about by both non-believers and believers Maybe. alike to describe the danger caused by American evangelicals who believe that their faith is being actively persecuted. Writing in the Atlantic... It is. I mean, not exclusively evangelicals, and probably not even mostly evangelicals, but... But again... And, and, and now, worth noting, a lot of these persecutions are not targeting 
American evangelicals, or even Christians. Um, but they are grafted in such a way that they disproportionately affect Christians. That is, <coughs> um, so just to use the COVID example, um, prohibitions and large gatherings. Well, guess what religion requires a large gathering every seven days? I'll give you a hint. It's mine. Um, so all these sorts of things. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at this uh, in more detail, but, but again, like there, there are plenty of laws on the books, which, which do specifically impact Christians for their Christianity. And that even includes evangelicals as well. So let's go. All right. Let's <clears throat> make some more points and let's see what, what we can do. Alan Noble, professor at Oklahoma Baptist University, says, Too much is at stake for evangelicals to waste our resources and credibility on frivolous and occasionally self-provoked injustices. Imagined offenses drummed up by sensationalists and fearmongers should be exposed and denied. At times, even legitimate offenses should be overlooked when they are petty. And the type of persecution complex that we see in the God's Not Fed movies is a very real thing. According to a 2017 poll carried out by the Public Religion Research Institute, white evangelicals believe that they face more discrimination than Muslims. Which, um, okay. Now, there are religious groups... Hold on. The discrimination that Muslims face and the discrimination that Christians face is radically different. So much so that it's very difficult to, to, to compare them to apples to apples. Uh, it's really an apples to oranges comparison. The reason for that is that discrimination against Muslims is a largely private affair. Now, it's significant. Don't get me wrong. It is very significant. Um... And, and again, a lot of that is as a result of uh, is sort of uh, impacts following 9-11 and such, uh, where Muslims gets, get banned for, get, not banned, get blamed for, uh, get blamed for acts of terrorism that they weren't involved with, collectivist thinking, that sort of thing. Fine. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Anti-Semitism as well is very similar to that sort of, that sort of discrimination. But the, process, the, the persecution of Christians in the U.S. and, and other Western nations is very different insofar as it is institutionalized. It is the kind of discrimination that we find in, uh, in the, what, uh, what like somebody like Curtis Yarvin will call the cathedral. Uh, that is the state. That is functionaries of the state. That is educational and business institutions. The, in other words, it is the the functioning order of society which is specifically against Christianity. And again, if you want, want me to justify this, I can. Uh, but I'm not going to go into it all now. The, the point is that these are these are legal discriminations. These are discriminations on the basis of legal frameworks. And again, now if we're going to go back to talking about wokeism, a lot of this is uh, as a result of a sort of leveling down egalitarianism. It's in the basis of equity uh, that 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 tr that um, historically Christians have been uh, have been broadly speaking in charge of society. Um, and so that means that they, uh, they need, that other groups need a leg up. And that means that Christianity and Christians need to be, uh, socially hobbled, so to speak. Uh, I think Harrison Bergeron, if you want a, an example of this sort of thing, um, short story, like the fictional example to clarify, or I don't think that that would really happen just to clarify. Um, but the... Now, other aspects of this, of course, are are the ideological opposition uh, that uh, that the 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 modern the modernist, I, I guess, um, the secular order, broadly speaking, that uh, the 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 secular hegemon, as uh, as well as somebody like William Cavanaugh would put it, uh, the secular hegemon has a has a particular uh, opposition to Christian groups, particularly Christian groups that are out of power or who are opposed to um, existing power structures, existing secular power structures. Uh, and that is, again, because uh, that they, uh, they find themselves uh, to be disruptive, I suppose you would say, disruptive to social order. And so the social order which exists is in opposition to them. And so this is where we get uh, you know, viewpoint discrimination, legal discrimination, discrimination, uh, on the basis, like fueled by the law and fueled by by powerful institutions uh, against particular uh, particular groups of people that are not traditionally marginalized, uh, and so again, the the kind of discrimination, the kind of persecution against 
Christians, including evangelical Christians in this case, uh, is is very very different from the type of persecution that you'll find uh, carried out against Muslims against Jews, um, because the the persecution of Christians and I'll say I will I will say uh, against certain groups of Muslims, certain groups of Jews in certain contexts. To be fair, that that kind of persecution is institutionalized, whereas uh, sort of run of the mill Islamophobia and anti Semitism uh, is is very private, is very, you know, people, individual people, you know, don't like them Muslims or, or you know, think, well, or are Kanye West, for example, that sort of thing. But again, that's a very different kind of discrimination. So it's an apples and oranges kind of comparison. And that's why. That's why he sees this as as so distinct from each other that, that, that because he doesn't see the the legal discrimination happening, and that's ironically given what's on screen right now. The whole point about the whole point that I think all of these movies are making is about the institutional discrimination that occurs against Christians. Um, they focus specifically on evangelicals, but but again, any any vaguely conservative or traditional christian group is going to see this this very same kind of kind of persecution uh, on behalf of the legal order on behalf of the educational institutions the cultural institutions business institutions etc under threat of oppression and violence in america but let's go which, back a sec um okay now there are religious groups under threat of oppression and violence in america but they surely aren't white protestant christians in the south this part of the film feels fair enough um they're probably not the most persecuted even in this, even in this sense, um, they are to a degree. Um, but again, in the South, in the South, uh, Christianity, evangelical Christianity, still has <coughs> some degree of institutional power. And because they still have some degree of institutional power, they're not going to have the same same level of persecution that they would have in, say, the Pacific Northwest, New England, California, uh, and even to some degree in uh, in sort of. Uh, any real metropolitan area where you'll get where you'll get um, the, the the sort of the sort of secularist uh, persecuting. Uh, that said, there are Christian groups who are universally persecuted, and they are universally persecuted because, as I was saying, they sort of pre they present the sort of disruption to the social order. Catholics among them, um, sometimes uh, sometimes Mormons are included in this. Uh, generally, uh, historically, you get Jehovah's Witnesses included in this, though not as much these days. Uh, but, but again, it's 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 Christian groups that do not have particular institutional power in a particular area in a particular political climate, um, who are in opposition to the to the uh, secular hegemonic uh, ideology, which currently is broadly speaking, um, broadly speaking. Um, in, uh, enlightenment modernism or in some cases postmodernism and that is what you'll find so <clears throat> white christians white evangelical christians in the south uh probably are some of the least persecuted uh traditional broadly traditional christians uh but they are so they do still face this kind of institutional discrimination whenever the institutions can manage to reach uh reach into somewhere like the south especially icky in the light of all America, but they surely aren't white protestant christians in the south this part of the film feels especially icky in the light of all of the anti-muslim and anti-semitic violence and harassment that's all too common in america these days all of which literally all of which is perpetrated by private criminals or just private citizens sometimes these aren't even crimes sometimes it's just like rude things not criminal things but in any case Every single instance of, of anti-Muslim discrimination in the U.S. is non-institutional. At least, hmm, that's probably not true. I probably overstated that. The vast majority certainly are. And it's, it, it, the, the, the instances of private discrimination wildly outpace and um, in terms of impact and certainly outnumber uh, cases of institutional discrimination against Muslims. And so again, it's a difference in kind. Uh, and again, I wouldn't... It, it's hard to say which is worse. It's really genuinely hard to say which is worse. And I'm not, I'm not even just saying that just to, to say, well, maybe one's worse, maybe one's not. I'm not, I'm not just hedging here because they're, they're different 
they're different things to consider altogether. And so, again, I think he's just comparing apples and oranges here and doesn't realize it. Uh, or he just thinks that the people who are talking about oranges are just talking about apples. In other words, he thinks that uh, that you know white evangelical Southern Baptists are talking about private persecution and are not talking about the state and institutions and all that stuff. I think that he's missing that. And I think it's largely because he's, he's, if not part of those institutions, he's ideologically aligned with those institutions. Okay, so we survived another God's Not Dead film. Only two more to go, assuming they ever stop. At the end of the day, this movie's attempt to prove religion be I might do the rest of these. I'm not planning on it, but if you guys really want me to, I will look at what he says about the rest of them. The historical evidence ends up undermining everything that is theologically significant about faith in the first place. For a movie that's presumably about the importance of faith, it does a really bad job of understanding it. And to be clear, I am not coming at this from some angry new atheist perspective. I was raised Catholic and have a lot of respect for many of the wonderful and weird uh... Of course he was raised Catholic. I went to 12 years of Catholic school. That means I'm a better theologian than St. Thomas Aquinas. You know how many times I hear that? I am, I am Catholic, as it so happens. And I am a Catholic philosopher. I have degrees in philosophy and history. And I've studied Catholic history and Catholic philosophy extensively. I actually am credentialed in this subject. And that is not the same as I went to Catholic school. And so when the nuns hit me with a ruler, I felt bad. And that's why I'm an atheist now. But I still respect people of faith, as long as they're not mean or nun people. This is ridiculous. Every serious Catholic knows exactly why I'm so angry right now. <laughs> but do go on, Wisecrack. Continue, please. If it makes people loving and kind, who am I to judge? But when evaluated from the perspective of theology and philosophy, none of this movie's uh... doctrines make any sense. Which is horrible for me in particular. Okay. He's... Let's hear this again, because I'm getting mad. I didn't hear all of it clearly, because I was groaning. Clear. I am not coming at this from some angry new atheist perspective. I was raised Catholic and have a lot of respect for many of the wonderful and weird religions of the world. If it makes people loving and kind, who am I to judge? But wait, let's let's continue. He's about to contradict himself. Let's let him do it. Let's let him hang himself. Give him enough rope. When evaluated from the perspective of theology and philosophy, none of this movie's gotcha moments make any sense. If it makes people love and respect each other, who am I to judge? But if we evaluate objectively from the perspective of philosophy, then I am to judge. Oh my God. Okay. So, so mm, this, this, this line of reasoning drives me up the wall because you see it all the time. I see it all the time. I don't know about you. I see this all the time in my classroom. And if you're one of my students and you do this, I'm watching you and I disapprove. I don't disapprove of you watching other non-academic content, that's fine. I disapprove of that method of thinking, because it's it's atrocious. It's absolutely, resolutely self-contradictory, and it should be obviously so. And for a philosopher, a professional philosopher like Wisecrack, to think this and to put this forward should be an embarrassment. He is asserting here that he respects all religions and thinks that they all have a role to play and that there's nothing wrong with them so long as they get people to be loving and nice to each other. That that is the standard by which religions ought to be judged. And then he has the gall to go on to say that we ought to evaluate religions philosophically? And we ought to evaluate their truth claims? Because again, evaluating a religion based on its truth claims is to say that it is either true or it is false, objectively in terms of the facts of the matter, not in terms of what it makes you feel like and how it makes you behave. This is, ugh, I should have known that this would be Kantian nonsense, because this is, again, Kantians of Kant tried desperately to reduce, the re reduce religion to the merely ethical. And in so doing, eliminated everything significant and important about religion, which is what this guy just did in two sentences. Embarrassing. This is this is not how a philosopher should conduct himself, not even slightly. Okay, uh, he's about to compliment Melissa Joan Hart, so let's continue because 
which is horrible for me in particular, as Clarissa and Sabrina were incredibly important influences during my formative years. Okay, that's yeah, all fair. for this one. Same. Tune in next holiday season for God's Not Dead 3, A Light in the Darkness. And let us know. Okay, anyway. I also like Melissa Joan Hart. She's she's fantastic. I, I love Sabrina the Teenage Witch. The the original one, not the, the older one, the like nineties one, not the not the recent satanic nonsense. But man. That was awful. It was truly terrible. That's all I got, guys. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you're not as exasperated as I am. I hope you had a good time. I, I had a good time. The brandy helps. Anyway. Uh, this was fun. This was wrong. Thank you for making me suffer through this, and thank you for suffering through it with me. Anyway. See you all next time, and remember, don't be safe, be well, and more importantly, be good, and dear God, take religion seriously. Like, really.